Hey, thanks Mace. Wish I was there with you in person in the center. Hi everybody, good to see you there. And hi everybody online. How are you doing? Take a minute if you want to chat in and tell us where you're from, uh, where you're zooming in from. I'm here on Liz John Ohlone land, AKA Berkeley and uh, share with us where we are. Are we still mostly SF people or are we kind of branching out a little bit? <laughs> Oakland, San Francisco, Berkeley. Uh, sometimes we have people from other places. Seattle, yay, Petaluma, cool. Oh my God, Vancouver, Canada. Elena, nice to have you, hi. <laughs> are, how many people are in the 21 TARS course that I do through Tar Mandala? Anyone there? Yeah? Okay. Uh-huh. Hi. Chelsea. Namaste from San Jose. It rhymes. Um, New Jersey, LA. This is so great because, you know, the last time I asked that, it, most of the people were from San Francisco and I was thinking, well, we should, you know, we're online. We could have more people from different places. It's fun, fun to feel that, the unification of, of our practices. Hey, Paul. Yeah, you're in the 21 Taras. So I have changed my mind. <laughs> We're not going to start the book tonight. So maybe Eve will start it next week. I have been uh, on another wavelength uh, writing my book and I haven't really had a chance to share with you the huge part of my life and my teaching, which is on Tara or Tara, um, the female Buddha of compassion. So I thought I would take advantage of this little bardo, this kind of in-between space that we've been in between books and all of that, <clears throat> to share a bit more about my work and then guide a practice. We're going to do the first Tara tonight, <clears throat> the Bodhicitta Tara, which is a good way to start. So um, that is what I'm going to do, and I figure it's going to be a good exposure for people who aren't familiar with the feminine, you know, women in Buddhist Tantra, female Buddhas, uh, female teachers. I know a lot of people who come from Vipassana don't really get a lot of that. I mean, hopefully you have good teachers who start to talk more about that, but that's my experience because women don't really play um, a kind of more overt public scene part in Dharma until they're until the Dharma got a little older, <laughs> until the Mahayana, latter Mahayana, and then the Tantrayana, the Tantric phases. So, you know, I've been teaching through Against the Stream and now SFDC for probably four or five years, six years, I don't know, for a long time. But I don't really bring this part of myself to you all very much because we're more Lojong, which is also a big part of my practice, and I love it. But I want to tell you that practicing tara and doing sadhana with mantra and visualization is mind training. It's mind training. Mind training is an a umbrella term for meditations, contemplations, teachings that help us do what? Train the mind. Train the mind in what? Greater compassion for others, less self-focused grasping on ourself, you know, and then balancing the two. Of course, it's important for self-care to, to have a high sense of self-worth and value. But lojong or mind training teachings are all about training the mind for greater capacity of connection, compassion, and all the six perfections of uh, generosity, ethical discipline, or basically just ethics, like being a good person. Um, the third one is patience. That's been my big learning edge my whole life. And then there's concentration. No, there's patience. And then there's enthusiastic effort. It's such a cool word. I mean, it's kind of a downer off for me. I'm like, yeah, like sometimes I don't want to do stuff that I know I should do. But the way that you can translate this word is um, it's Tsundru in Tibetan, and it means applying effort with enthusiasm. <laughs> so we come to practice with a sense of enthusiasm, and knowing that it's good for us, training the mind will make us more happy. So that's the fourth. And then the fifth is concentration, aka meditation, samten, 
and then that's Tibetan Samten. And then um, the sixth perfection is wisdom, and not just any old wisdom. What kind of wisdom? A lot of you have been coming for a while. Probably know when we say wisdom, it's a catchword in Buddhism. It's just not any old, like old man with a beard wisdom. What is wisdom in Buddhism across the board? Take a guess. Unmute, type it in. How do you define wisdom in Buddhist practice, especially within this lojong? Well, skillful means is the other wing of the bird of enlightenment. So you have wisdom on the one side, and then skillful means imbued with compassion is the other wing. So that's the, the way that they articulate that. That's a good guess, Elena. So when we have the experience of wisdom, what is that experience? <laughs> I hope I'm not catching you unawares here, but this is good to know. This gets Insight. you a little bit thinking. Huh? Insight. Insight into what? Into wisdom. <laughs> good try, good try. Go, you're on to something. Come on, go for it. Seeing things as they really are, Bill, yes. And how are things really are? How are things really? True. Huh? True? <clears throat> Truth. Uh, on the conventional true. level, they're not true. They're appearing yet not existing the way that they appear. So maybe they're not true. Are they illusory? Yes, why are we? Because we don't have the wisdom to see things like they really are. Well, that's one way to answer that. That's kind of copping out. Be a little um, cop out. Come on. Reality. Reality. <laughs> it's not a, it's just a small little question. It's a good one. Impermanence, Chelsea. Yay. Yay. Emptiness. Emptiness. Yes. Who's that? Who said that? Paul. You get a gold star, Paul. Paul. Yeah, because he's in my 21 Taurus course, so he knows. <laughs> okay, great. So wisdom into the empty nature of mind and phenomena. That's what wisdom means. So that's what I want you to learn as students of mine. Students, listen up. If you here, if you if you learn about wisdom, you're reading a book, a root text on Dharma, or getting a teaching from somebody, and they talk about wisdom, you know, oh, wisdom. Wisdom isn't just an intellectual knowledge learned from outside. It's kind of, the word for it in Tibetan is a pragya. And pra means periphery. Or you can t also think of profound. It's the same Indo-European root. And then gnya, which is J-N with a little squiggle, A, or a G-N. It's the same <laughs> Indo-European root as our word gnosis, to know, knowledge, K-N. In, in Sanskrit, it's J-N, and it's pronounced gnya, <laughs> gnya. <laughs> Some people say gnya, but that's a little bit like a lazy tongue. Um, so gnya, gnya, pragnya, pragnya. Gnya means to know. So it's a profound knowing. It's a deep knowing. Somebody's not muted. So um, make sure you're muted. So that is wisdom in a Buddhist context, wisdom. And so we train the mind, lojong, to see the world as illusory. That's right, Bill, you were onto it. You just, you just almost made the mark and you knew it. See, after, after Paul said it, you're like, oh, I knew it because you've studied with us for a long time. Back in the day, Bill used to come when it was against the stream, you'd sit on the right. <laughs> and you're a very good student. It's good to see you back. So um, it's good for us to know that you don't have to memorize all the lists, but to have a basic sense of what's the path. Oh, the path is, you know, the Eightfold Path, of course, right? Thinking, right intention, right um, livelihood, all of that is important. But also in more of the mind training uh, bodhisattva path, which comes around more in the Mahayana time, which is really kind of the thrust or the gestalt of this class. This is what you get in this class, is you get Mahayana Buddhism, the great vehicle Buddhism, which arose in around the turn of the millennia, around the time of Jesus in India. And it's the main thrust of the movement started around the first century CE with the discovery of these Pragya Paramita sutras. These are the perfection of wisdom. See, Pragya, 
Paramita is perfection. Pragya Paramita, the perfection of wisdom, sutras which teach all about impermanence, emptiness, and compassion, which is skillful means. So, two wings of the Buddha bird to, that will take you to enlightenment. One, wisdom, and that's more symbolized by the sacred feminine, actually, which is interesting. And then the other wing is skillful means, which is imbued with compassion, associated with the masculine, the sacred masculine, and we have those elements within us. We all have that. So practice is about watering those seeds so that we can live a fulfilled life and be of service because that's really why we're here, remember? I mean, we're here not to just, you know, go to movies <laughs> and work to the bone, right? We're here to actually take advantage of this human life, train our mind so that maybe the next time around it's a little easier. <laughs> we're a little better off. And then next time, next time. Or maybe, as Tantra promises, you can attain liberation in one life. That's, wouldn't that be nice? Like, just get it done? Like, you're here. This is important to you. You're not at the bar. <laughs> maybe you could do it. Maybe I could do it. In my early 20s, I was sure I could do it. <laughs> now I'm like, okay, maybe a few more times around. <laughs> I went to India thinking, I am going to attain enlightenment in one year. I'll come back. I'll be happy. Everything will be great. <laughs> I was so wrong. Instead, I loved it, but it took me a while. And I descend, I went, I dropped down into the deep, dark night of the soul, <laughs> which is an important part of the path. But I didn't see it that way. Of course, I expected it to be all love and light. But it's not all love and light. Liberation is also about witnessing and bearing the weight and then integrating it like the peacock eats the poison and then transmuting it into the iridescent feathers. That's what Tantra is. Tantra is the path of transformation. That's how it's defined. Dzogchen is the path of liberation, natural liberation. So that's even cool. I mean, that's not cooler, but it's kind of like, yeah. That's the one. Tantra promises liberation in one life, but so does, <laughs> so does Dzogchen, if you do it right, you know, if you, if you get it. Some people have a propensity for things like this. Other people, it takes a while, and that's okay. And Dharma is so deep and wide. It's so pra, you know, whew, expansive, that you can read things and get a certain amount, and then you go back to it maybe five, ten years later, and you're like, oh, wow, I'm getting even more out of this. And that is because dharma, no matter what stream it's from, early, middle, or later, you know, more Vipassana, Theravada, early, middle, Mahayana, later, Tantrayana, Tantric or Vajrayana, the diamond vehicle, same thing, all synonyms. No matter what you study, in a way, it's like all self-secret. Self-secret, which means when you're ready, you the secrets will be revealed. You can learn a text that's meant only for advanced people, and if you're not ripe and ready, no problem, you're just not going to get it, you know? You just won't get it. But then later, if you come back to it, you start to get it. That natural, that self-secret thing just unravels, so you don't have to, you know, sometimes there are texts, like the first text that I ever published was a translation of two Dzogchen texts, which could only be given to people with Dzogchen empowerment, with a certain level of practice. So it was funny because I was so excited about this book that I, I, I wrote the introduction, I worked hard on translating it, these were beautiful texts, but I wasn't allowed to give them to like 95% of my friends. <laughs> you know, so there's value in that. But then there are other things that are just, it's, it's okay. You might come across a text, you don't get it. You pick it up five years later after some teachings and some retreats and you get it. So Dharma is like that. It keeps revealing itself over time. So I want to guide you through a practice, but I want to give you just a little bit of context. So this is, what I'm going to guide you through is a sadhana, which means a spiritual practice with the beginning, middle, and end. You know, we'll arouse our bodhicitta, that's the beginning, and then we'll recite the mantra and visualize ourselves as tara and, and pray for liberation and bodhicitta to increase in the world. So it's got that kind of activist 
quality where you get to you get to combine your spiritual life with your activist life you know sometimes we feel so um, impotent with the suffering of the world and we don't know what to do we can volunteer we can donate we can speak out we can sign petitions we can try to be of benefit but then there are also times when uh, we're just totally powerless practice can be used in those times say mantra recitations say prayers for the world prayers can help if they're not helping the world they're certainly helping us so in a way it helps us to definitely create more positive neuronal connections right we're, we're feeding the good grooves traversing and you know watering those good pathways rather than you know negative ones fear and one of Tara's main powers is she helps beings from danger from fear which has so many beautiful implications I mean when I started writing the book I thought a lot about fear and what is fear fear is you know fear of a snake fear of getting in a car wreck fear of uh, losing a child fear these are fear of dying these are real fears but then there's also the subtle more subtle ways that fear lives in us right more subtle ways that fear it can almost rule the rule the show and we, we don't even know it it's like taking off a blur. fear of failure right fear of not being loved fear of of losing the person that you love so there are ways that fear can live in us in a more subtle way that I feel also that the sadhana, it can, even mindfulness practice, lojong, metta, donglen, all of these practices can help us sift down and heal, heal those subtle ways of thinking that uh, might, not, might, might not be necessary. You know? How do we find more freedom from fear in our life? So maybe take a moment and think about how does fear live in how fear how does fear live in you in a subtle way? I mean, it's obvious that we're afraid of getting burned or fires or something more subtle. If you want to, you can chat it in as a way to share and make a make a poem together, or you can just think about it. You don't have to be public with it. Exactly. False feelings of unworthiness. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow we learn these things. It's, sometimes it's time to let them go. Maybe they helped us for some reason when we were young, but then we don't really need to hold on to them anymore. Imposter syndrome. How many people have that? <laughs> I know we can have that. I have that too. I'm writing a book and I'm thinking, oh my God, <laughs> you know, when I'm putting this out there, what if it's, what if people shoot holes through it? What if people don't like it? I just have to trudge, you know, rock on my treadmill desk right through those clouds, you know, just keep going. And then I have moments of like, this is really good. I'm loving my life, you know, but what seeds do we water? Fear of not being good enough. Yes, that's a good universal one. I think a lot of us share that. Fear to have not financial security. Yeah, that, that's a really root chakra fear too. You know, like the base, the home, the security. So some of these fears are well-founded, but we can also... Um, make friends with them like the Tsokni Rinpoche practice of sh handshake you know shake hands with it or feeding your demons you know make friends find the ally in it yeah fear of leaving my loved ones right yeah yeah whether it's moving or whether it's passing yeah. so in this practice of the first Tara I'm going to guide you through visualizing her I want to show you her her 
her um, picture. I'll show you the line drawing of her. And then we'll do the practice. The practice can take anywhere between 15 and 15 minutes and 15 hours, really, as you like, depending on like, there's a moment where we dissolve everything and we rest in simple, you know, unfabricated awareness. We just rest. And you can spend as long as you want in that. But before we do the dissolution, we uh, recite mantra for a while. And you can also do that as long as you want. Sometimes you get on a roll and you're like, yeah, I'm doing 10 malas. <laughs> if you have a mala, you can get it. And you don't need it, though. You don't need it. You know, if you have a mala, some people ask, how do I use the mala? You can, in Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, you can hold it in the left or the right. In in Hindu practices, you would hold it in the right because you don't use you don't do sacred things with the left hand. That's for other things, if you know what I mean. But in in Tibet, they didn't have they didn't do that. So they the red the left hand's clean, the right hand's clean. So I learned from my teacher the left hand, and you drape the mala over either the index or more often the middle finger. And then the thumb pulls the mala, pulls the, the bead. One. So, Om Tari Tu Tari Ture Swaha. Om Tari Tu Tari Ture Swaha. Like that. And you can hold it at your heart, you know, so that it's sort of here. That's really common. Or you can just hold it down on your knee. Hold the hand on the knee and let it drape off the knee. And if you don't have a mala, I recommend getting one and making it your own. Uh, make it your own. Get one that you like. These are lotus seeds. I like these a lot. Lotus tree seeds. And then these are a little more something you don't have to worry about maybe. Some of you do would want some of these. I don't really know everybody's background. But these are really cool. These are little counting beads for when you recite a lot of mantras and you want to keep track. Um, in any case, it's 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 a nice... Thing to have, you know, it's like a, like a fuzzy blanket. It means something to you, and you know, I think people sometimes like malas, but they don't quite know how to use them, so they wear them because they have a connection to it, but they don't use it. So, I try to encourage people to really use it. Say, a, say a mantra. Mantra is mind training. Mantra literally means mind protection. So, if you have a mala, you can use it tonight or. Go find one some some day and start integrating it into your practice. A mala will have 108 um, beads. It will have the guru bead, which is the big one in the at the end there. It's a, this main one's called the guru. Sorry, the guru bead. This guy. So one more thing about the mala, like if you go all the way around, like oh money pamyung, oh money pamyung, oh money pamyung. Om Mani Pamyung, Om Mani Pamyung, Om Mani Pamyung. And you get all the way around, you do 108, and you get to the Guru bead. You want to turn the mala and go in the reverse direction. Om Mani Pamyung, Om Mani Pamyung, Om Mani Pamyung. Om Mani Pamyung, Om Mani Pamyung, Om Mani Pamyung. You go around, you get all the way to the Guru bead, and then you switch directions. Why? It's so funny. You don't want to step over your Guru. <laughs> you don't step over your Guru. I did mantra for years before I learned that. I thought, oh no, I've done it wrong for t 10 years. It's just a sweet, it's a sweet thing. It's a t the Tibetan way. So uh, we'll do some mantra recitation and visualization. So if this is new to you, just feel like it's a journey. I'm taking you on a journey so you can experience something new. It's, this is a very characteristic practice of um, Tibetan Buddhism, Himalayan Buddhism, uh, tantric Buddhism, same thing. So, can you make me a co-host, please? I'd like to share my screen. Thank you. So, while we're getting that, deity yoga is uh, the part is another name for what we're doing. It's yoga means union to yoke. 
Deity in the Buddhist context doesn't mean God. It, um, the Buddha taught that there is no God. But in Mahayana and Tantric Buddhism, um, enlightened beings b became more um, prayed to, honored, and, and apparent in those later traditions. So then you have Avalokiteshvara, whose mantra is Omani Padme Hung, Bodhisattva of Compassion. You have Amitabha, who's the, the Buddha of long life. You have Adara, who's the female, the female Buddha of compassion, liberation from fear. And so y these deities are the name for them, but really what they are are archetypal expressions of enlightened mind. They're not real things out there. They're just as real as you are, Bill. <laughs> And how real and true are we? Well, we appear, but we're empty of intrinsic existence. You know, we say I this, I that, but really the I is illusory. So in a sense, what the, what the teachings say is the deities, they appear, yet they're empty, just like we are, actually. And what we're doing is we're connecting to a realm of light, bliss. It's called the Sambolgakaya. It's the more subtle dimension. Um... That has that's come from the source and just manifested as light. That's the domain of the Sambhogakaya deities. I, I think of it as like the angels, you know, angels. So, but we get to practice non-self by temporarily dissolving the ego of I'm Bill, I'm Kevin, I'm Elena, and say, okay, I'm not that for a little bit. I'm Tara. And how does it feel to be Tara? And all gender identities do, do, can do any gender. The, the monks do Tara practice. You know, it's not a big issue. It doesn't matter. It's, I'm sure it's good for everybody. And the female gendered identity will do the male Buddha practices. Imagining you're them. It's not an issue. So uh, let's go ahead. I'll share the screen now. And we'll probably do the practice for about um, maybe half hour, maybe 40 minutes. So make sure you're comfortable as I'm kind of orienting here. So this is the first Tara. She's really intense out of the gate, but in a joyful way. You can tell by her furrowed brow. She's not all like peaceful like the green Tara is. Some of the Taras in the 21 Tara Pantheon uh, this is what my book is about, the different expressions of the Divine Feminine through the lens of the 21 Tharas. So this is the first of the 21. And um, some of them are peaceful, some of them are fierce, and some of them are joyful, which is a semi-peaceful and semi-fierce characteristic. So the uh, somebody's unmuted again. Um, the... I'm wondering if the group, if the, the, um, if Noam or Mace, you could make it so that people can't unmute themselves. It's a little good when we get into the sadhana because it can be distracting if somebody unmutes and starts talking to their spouse about <laughs> groceries. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So this, this furrowed brow shows that she's, she's sort of semi-fierce and semi-peaceful. She's joyful. That's the medium, the middle path. She's channeling a lot of, of juicy energy. She's actually red in color, which you can't tell here, but that's her color. She's sitting in a really cool posture, call it, which you can take. I will encourage you to try it when you're seated in the practice, when we, get, when we embody her. But she's seated in this posture of the royal ease, which means her right leg is slightly forward, stepping into samsara, to be of help to beings. She's stepping down off of her throne, which is a lotus and moon disc throne, off into, onto a lotus, actually, you can see with her bare feet. Yeah. So that's her foot, they're stepping down. The right leg symbolizes available stepping down into samsara to be of service. Then the left leg is tucked in close. 
that symbolizes that she's fully stabilized and centered in nirvana, that she is in nirvana. She is liberated, and yet she decides to be available. Her right hand is on her right knee with the palm open. That's a gesture or a mudra, mudra of generosity. It's called the mudra of supreme generosity, meaning her commitment to uh, be of service, to li help liberate beings from suffering and bondage of suffering S ceaselessly. The open palm, that's what that means. And then her left hand is at her heart in the mudra of the three jewels, three jewels mudra, which uh, is her, you can try this, take it, I see people trying, go for it. It is with the ring finger and the thumb finger gently touching, and what they're doing is they're holding the stem of her lotus flower. And then the other three fingers fan out, and that represents the three jewels of Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So that's why it's called the Three Jewel Mudra. And then the thumb and the index touching means the union of wisdom and skillful means. The union, the unification of that. So that has meaning. Everything in Tantric iconography has meaning. Mind training. Showing us the way. Okay, so her lotus, as you can tell here, is blooming up above her left shoulder, right level with her left ear. And each tara has a different symbol on her lotus flower. This tara, this is our first tara, her name is Nyurma Pamo in Tibetan, which means a swift goddess. It's Tara Turavira, you'll see it below in a minute, Tara Turavira in Sanskrit. So her symbol is the conch, which is in a sense, in early Buddhism, it sort of became the, the logo of Dharma. It, it symbolizes the healing sound of the Dharma, the healing words of the Buddha. And so you can tell with the lines, it's trying to show us that this is a, a blowing, a self-blowing or natural blowing conch. It's always sounding that the call to the practice. Come, practice. It's really cool. If you don't know what a conch sounds like, you can Google it. And there's, even on Spotify, they have tracks of mostly just conch blowing. <laughs> so that symbol shows you that she is kind of, that that's also a part of her, that she is, she has this uh, naturally blowing conch on her shell, on her lotus. I won't go into everything else. It's interesting. There are 13 Sambhogakaya ornaments that she wears, like the crown and the necklace, the armlets, the bracelets, the anklets, the belt, the silks. All of that means something. <laughs> so it's, it's really cool, and it's connected with wisdom. She's surrounded by a halo of, of red light, which you can't see here because it's not in color. And then I wouldn't know what, maybe maybe this would be a golden light halo around her head. And she's always depicted in nature with mountains. Sometimes you see waterfalls, animals. <laughs> and below are offering bowls. It's like offering bowls that you would offer your teacher if your teacher came to your home. You would offer, um, well, first is uh, washing water to wash their feet and hands. The second bowl would be drinking water. The third bowl would hold flowers. The fourth bowl would be incense. The fifth bowl would be light, like a candle. Gande would be like perfume, and actually it, rec it represents massage, <laughs> which is cute. You would massage your teacher's shoulders, maybe, <laughs> after a long journey. Massage their feet. It just, it means scent, like a, ple a pleasant scent. And then the last one is for sound. Or actually, this would be the light. In the middle is the, the one where the big candle would be. So that would be the light. So it gives you a sense of the meaning of all of this. It's just really cool. Thinking about making a coloring book of all my Tata line drawings. This is going in my book. Okay, so here's her name, Droma Nyurma Pamo. In Sanskrit, Tara Tura Vira, which means, again, the swift, Tura, Vira means goddess. Drolma in Tibetan means Tara. It means she who liberates, the savioress. 
Nyurma is Tura, it means swift. Pamo is the same as Vira, it means goddess. So I translate her as Tara, the swift goddess. Okay, so now we're going to do the practice. You can follow along or you can close your eyes and um, just listen to my voice. So you don't have to look at the screen if you don't want to. All right, so take a comfortable seat and we'll do some relaxation breaths. Make sure you're warm or cool enough that your notifications are turned off. And this will be our practice time. So there are a few different ways we can do pranayama before practice. I will just teach you a more simple one tonight because we're online. I'm so glad the dog is here. The dog will get to become Tara too. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay, so settling in, making yourself comfortable. Allow the eyes to close and start to take a few deep breaths into the abdomen. <sighs> Release tension with the out breath. We'll do what we call the nine relaxation breaths. So for the first few breaths, breathe into any physical tension in your body. And then with the out breath, feel that tension melting down, down into the earth beneath you. And then with your next few breaths, breathe into any emotional tension, meaning where do you hold any emotional tightness or knots in your body? Breathe into it. And then with the out breath, feel that tension releasing down into the earth beneath you. And then with the next few breaths, breathe into any mental tension, meaning thoughts, worries, concerns you might have. Feel where you're holding mental tension in your body. Breathe into it. And then release. Feel that tension unraveling, melting, melting down into the earth beneath you. In a sense, you're offering this to the earth, even requesting the earth to carry your load Feel it draining off of your shoulders, out of your face, out of the scalp, the low back, the hips. Let the body settle into a comfortable position. And now imagine that from luminous empty space, your mind's eye, the imagination, from luminous empty space, Tara Nyurma Pamo appears in the space in front and slightly above you. So recalling her imagery as much as possible, seeing her red luminous body of light. And she's seated on a full moon disc atop a lotus flower, surrounded by numerous other wisdom beings like the other Taras and rainbow colors or other Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Gurus, teachers, Dakinis, allies. See them filling all of space like clouds in the sky. It can even be broad if you don't have a lot of specific in mind. Just imagine that the sky is filled with benevolent, like angels, like wisdom beings. Surrounding her, she's the primary figure her furrowed brow, her third eye open. She's powerful, yet she's compassionate. Red in color, semi-fierce, smiling, with a compassionate look on her face. Her eyes are wide open, round and flashing like lightning. So she's open and witnessing all aspects of the world the tragedy, the comedy, the beauty, 
So feel that, her loving presence. Even if you can't see it, don't worry about visualizing. Feel it like a, feel her like a warm light, like the sun with a red hue. And she and all the wisdom beings, they all appear radiant yet empty of solidity like rainbows in the sky. You may notice that her left hand is in the mudra of the three jewels at her heart, holding the stem of the blue lotus, the utpala flower, which rests above her left shoulder. And upon the lotus is a white conch shell that curls clockwise, symbolizing the healing sound of the dharma that brings love, joy, and compassion to all beings. And her right hand is placed on her right knee and faces upwards, palm open, in the Supreme Generosity Mudra. She is swift like the wind, and she liberates beings from suffering and protects them from fear. In particular, she increases the awakened heart of bodhicitta and removes obstacles. So in her presence, we recite the refuge and bodhicitta prayer, if you wish, taking your hand, hands in prayer at your heart. And you can say it out loud with me if you like, or just listen and let it sink in. I know some of you in the room, you don't have a close visual, it's fine. Just listen, I'll repeat it three times. Namo means I name, I honor, noble Tara. You who liberates beings from fear and suffering are the essence of all refuges. I take refuge in your vast loving compassion. In order to place all mother sentient beings in the state of enlightenment, I generate the twofold bodhicitta of aspiration and application. Bodhicitta of aspiration is the four measurables of love, compassion, equanimity, and joy. Bodhicitta of application are the six perfections that I listed earlier. Generosity, ethics, patience, enthusiastic effort, concentration, and wisdom. Again, Namo, noble Tara, you who liberates beings from fear and suffering are the essence of all refuges. I take refuge in your vast loving compassion. In order to place all mother sentient beings in the state of enlightenment, I generate the twofold bodhicitta of aspiration and application. Namo, noble Tara, you who liberates beings from fear and suffering are the essence of all refuges. I take refuge in your vast loving compassion. In order to place all mother sentient beings in the state of enlightenment, I generate the twofold bodhicitta of aspiration and application. All mother sentient beings refers to the idea that we've all been each other's mothers, we've all been each other's children throughout countless eons, and therefore we're all family, and we care for people as if they were our mother. So now we can imagine that the red Tara, Nyurma Pamo, rejoices in this prayer and with joy, then you get to join the Sambhogakaya, the enjoyment dimension of light by self-visualizing yourself as Tara and reciting her mantra. And we do this with the seed syllable of Tara, which is T-A-M, Tam. And with the first sounding of Tam, Manifest yourself now as Tara Nyurma Pamo, red in color, semi-fierce, meaning joyful, and luminous. Imagine that you are her now, body of light, red, luminous, not a flesh and bone. You are seated on a moon disk upon a red lotus flower. What would it feel like to be sitting on a moon disk would you feel weightless? Maybe the back pain would lighten. Feel yourself more buoyant. No gravity. 
You can either take this position now or just imagine that your right leg is extended slightly forward, stepping down to help beings in samsara. And then your left leg is close to your body, symbolizing resting in nirvana. Your left hand, take the mudra of the three jewels, holding the stem, feel like as if you're holding the stem of the blue lotus flower, which rests above your left shoulder. And then upon the lotus is the white conch shell that resounds the healing sound of dharma, so you can hear it in your left ear. And it pervades space. Your right hand is resting on your right knee with an open upward-facing palm in the mudra of supreme generosity. And now feel, even do it, that your eyes are wide open, flashing like lightning. Your mouth is smiling yet fierce, teeth showing. You're awake to the world. You're not checked out. <clears throat> and then lastly, within your body of red light, imagine that in your heart chakra, the very center of your sternum, is the red seed syllable, tam, you can look if you can see it, it's T-A-M, or you can see this, the Tibetan. Either one is fine. So imagine that thumb is written upon a moon disk in your heart within a sphere of red-colored light. And it's written so fine as if with a single hair, and it's effervescent, sparkling, light. And so now we're going to inhale a big loud dumb, long and slow, and as you sound it, you imagine that you become Dara, really from the dumb at your heart out, and feel what that's like, that pervading shift and change in who you are. The old self fades away for a little bit, and you get to embody Dara, Buddha, Dara. So inhale. Da Now with the second sounding of dumb as Tara Nyurma Pamo, imagine that you send rainbow light, this is like enlightened or wisdom rainbow light, out from the red dham at your heart, making offerings to all the Taras and wisdom beings in the space above you. This is your offering. Inhale. Da. Feel that they really receive that offering and they rejoice, they smile, celebrate this offering you've made. They're proud of you. They're happy that you're engaging in practice. Doesn't that feel good to be seen? To be acknowledged. And in response, as in reciprocity, they too send rainbow wisdom light back to you from their hearts, permeating your being. Joyfully, they send rainbow wisdom light back to you, blessing and empowering you. And you become fully activated as the luminous red Tara in Yodhmapamo. Inhale. Da. Really take your seed, any doubt, see if you can just really shed that and really imagine what would it feel like to be red, Dada, 
totally liberated, free of suffering. How would that feel? And let yourself steepen that as much as possible. And now, as Tara, we recite her mantra. We imagine that it circles around the thumb in our heart, around the edge of that little moon disk. It's standing upright, and it's actually turning to the left, counterclockwise, as the feminine mantras do. Turning left, counterclockwise, around the ridge, the edge of the, th- uh, the moon disk in your heart. And as you sound the mantra, light rays generate from the swirling, whirling ma- letters in your heart and radiate love, release from fear, vibrating with blessings and it sends rainbow light in all directions and removes obstacles to liberation for individuals, groups, communities, countries. You can really go big with this. You can be as specific as individuals, animals, people, and you can go even bigger galactically. So bringing relief from suffering with the wisdom light radiating from your heart and increasing love and compassion. She is the bodhicitta tara. And then if you like, you can also remember the conch, the healing shell, soothing and releasing beings from fear, consoling them, bringing them hope. And as you recite the mantra, we can imagine that all beings everywhere are free from suffering and they awaken to their true nature. The light and the sound are expressions of Tata's love and compassion for all beings without exception. So here is her mantra. It's just similar to her main mantra, but then you have the word bodhicitta inserted right before the swaha. So it's om tare, tutare, ture, bodhicitta, swaha. So we'll recite this for a while now, imagining rainbow light emitting from your heart in all directions. I'll do about 21 slow, and then we'll go into a more kind of rhythmic japa style of um, quieter recitation for a bit longer. Om Tare Tutare Ture Bodhicitta Svaha 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 <coughs> Om Tare Tutare Ture Bodhicitta Svaha 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 Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re 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 Bodhicitta Svaha 
Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Purichita Svaha. Now recite at your own pace, no rush, just go at your own pace. And if you're just struggling with learning the mantra, that's great. Just go for it and have a loving heart. Have a wish that all beings are blessed by Bodhicitta, that they're free of suffering. That's all you need to do if it's too much. Otherwise, do whatever feels good. Feeling the swirling of the mantra around the heart, emitting like a generating generator of loving wisdom, rainbow light, all beings as you recite the mantra. Om Tari Tari Ture Bodhicitta Svaha Om Tari Tari Ture Bodhicitta Reciting like the buzzing of the bees, meaning kind of under your breath. Another teaching is you recite just loud enough for your collarbone to hear. Om Tari Tari Ture Bodhicitta Svaha Om Tari Tari Ture Bodhicitta Svaha Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Bodhicitta Svaha Om Dari Tu Really get into this. We'll spend about 10 minutes here. So really get deep into it. Feel the mantra vibrating in your body. Feel the blessings of Tara all around you. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re. You are Tara. How does that feel? Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Bodhicitta Svaha Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Bodhicitta Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Bodhicitta Svaha Om Dari Tu Dari and then just fake it till you make it. If you're having a hard time really jumping in, that's all right. Just try it like you're trying on a a, a new coat. Just try it for a while. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Bodhicitta Svaha Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Bodhicitta Svaha Om Dari Tu Relax. Don't be rigid. Be soft, fluid. You can even sway a little from left to right or forward back as a rhythmic Loosening up the body. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Bodhicitta Svaha. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Bodhicitta Svaha. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re. Feel your heart open. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Bodhicitta Svaha. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Bodhicitta Svaha. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Bodhicitta Svaha. You can recite quietly if you like also, that's fine. Mentally is okay. Just stay with it like a mindfulness practice. Shamatha can be done with the mantra. So keep the mind with the mantra, with the light, sending of light rays, and recite the mantra. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Bodhicitta Om Dari Tu Dari Tu If you're in a room with other people, it's okay. You're going to hear them. You're going to have your own rhythm. Just imagine you're in an old monastery in Tibet with hundreds of people reciting the mantra like this under their breath. You don't have to be aligned. You all don't have to be doing it at the same rhythm. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Om 
Sending rainbow light to people you would rather not. <laughs> Just like the Donglen, you can send it to people you love, you know, you don't know, and people you might not like. Just see the wisdom rainbow light flowing to specific people, places, communities, countries, surrounding the power plant in Ukraine, safety and release from ignorance that makes people do crazy things. You name it. Let you imagine... Be free here, sky is the limit, and send those prayers to them. Don't limit yourself. Don't let the mind stay in that mundane, humdrum, daily reruns. See if you can really open yourself right now. Open, open. Greater potential. <laughs> People who do harm have more bodhicitta, may it be so. You can even see them receiving this rainbow light and suddenly they turn into tara until space is infinitely filled with rainbow-colored taras. People realize their true nature and stop their harmful ways. Dari to Dari to Ray, but it is a home, Dari to Ray, but it is a home, Dari to Ray, but it is a Tari tu tari tu re bodhi chita svaha. So, in one kind of blast of imaginational potency and limitlessness, imagine that everything is already perfect. 
There's nothing left to be done. All the problems are solved. Just this explosion of light, liberation for all beings everywhere. And then we do the dissolution here. So after the mantra recitation is complete, now imagine that the universe and all of its inhabitants dissolve into blissful light. And that light dissolves into you as Tara Nyurma Pamo. And then you dissolve into light from the crown of your head and the soles of your feet slowly dissolving and converging at the heart center. Slowly, slowly dissolving towards the heart center until you dissolve into the red sphere containing the moon disk, mantra, and seed syllable. And then this sphere dissolves into the moon disk, the mantra, and then finally everything dissolves into the dham at the center until that's all that remains, this effervescent, finely written dham, the seed of Dada's wisdom. And then the dham begins to dissolve of the letters all the way up, slowly like a candle wick, dissolving, dissolving until the very top dissolves into luminous emptiness. And then rest in the spacious awareness that remains, free of fabrications, free of distraction, just rest either with the eyes closed or slightly open, if you wish, gazing just above the horizon line, softening the visual field, and rest the mind in its natural state. A slightly uplifted gaze is the nature of mind practice. If you want to try it, please do. We turn the eyes up, it opens the channel to the heart, So rest and just feel, just feel. If thoughts converge, just dissolve and rest in that open, spacious awareness. And then slowly begin to come back. Return to your form again as Tara Nyurma Pamo. Feel yourself as her, luminous and powerful and fully integrated. And continue this visualization, this feeling as much as you can as you rise from your meditation seat and go about your day. Let's dedicate the merit, positive energy of our practice. You can recite out loud with me or listen along. Just one time. Through this virtue, may I quickly attain the state of noble Tara. May I bring each and every being without exception to that state. And may all beings be healthy, free from suffering and its causes. And may they awaken to their true nature. May it be so. Thank you. So that concludes the sadhana to the first tara, Nyurma Pamo. 
At the bottom, I include a colophon which explains where this practice came from, the lineage. If you're curious, um, you can. What I'll do is make sure that the um, SFDC has this PDF and can post it on our YouTube channel. But um, yeah, I don't know how else we could send it to the group. Uh, I don't have a PDF sharing link for it right now. But I do want to give this to you. It's something you can do on your own. Now that you've kind of received the practice, this oral transmission is complete. You know, you've received the oral transmission of it through doing. So uh, that's a practice you could you could do on your own and spend more time with the mantra or less, however you like. Rest in that awareness, the disillusion state for longer. That is actually preparation for death. <laughs> You just dissolve everything and you converge your mind at the heart space. And then poof, even let go of that. The grand finale, you know. Give it your best shot. <laughs> um, any questions, comments, sharings? That was really different than what we normally do. So now you... You, I've shown you another whole other side of what I do and um, what I practice and what I teach. And I'm writing a book on these taras and applying modern day, not all modern, but they are real life women to each of the taras as uh, ways of bringing them alive. So I have a whole talk on on who I've chosen for the first tara. It's in my. It's going to be in my book as well. So maybe next time I could go more into that. But let's feel, let's stick with the practice. Um, how is the mantra recitation? Was that new for some of you? Good. I'm getting some notes here. So Elena asks, "What does the lotus feet mean?" Yeah, it's interesting. Lotus Padma is is a symbol of beauty and also like. Um, like in a good way, seductiveness. It's the symbol of the Western dimension, the Padma family, and that's all about magnetizing. But what I've learned is that Padma feet, lotus feet, lotus lips, lotus face, lotus eyes, sometimes in poetry, the lotus is used with, with different parts of the body, and it also means the female genitalia, the vulva, is the Padma. Um, and so they'll use that to to explain the beauty of a being or a majesty of so like Tara if she has lotus feet, um, but that the lotus position is also the 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 fully folded position where the f heels are up on the thighs and full lotus. Yeah. Um, Chelsea liked it. It's so good. Did the second 21 Tara class and got very attached to Green Tara, but recently had really forgotten about how much I love it and how much it moves emotion for me. This was such a beautiful reminder, bringing the Taras back. Thanks, Chandra. That's great. Thanks, Chelsea. Yeah. Can we uh, recitate the mantra reading? What? Can you retype that? What would that mean? You can recite the mantra while reading. Do you want me to tell you what it means? <laughs> Playing like charades here. Um, I didn't explain what the mantra means, but it's quite simple. It just means Om, the universal sound of consciousness. Om, it's the beginning of all mantras, most of them. And then um, Om Tare, Om Tare, Tu Tare, Tu Re Bodhi Chitta Svaha. I typed it there. So Om is a universal sound of consciousness. Tare is the vocative of Tara, means O oh, Tara, or Tara with exclamation point. I'm calling you. Pick up the phone. Tu Tare, I'm researching it amazingly, like a bunch of Sanskrit scholars have different interpretations. But let's just say Tut could be a uh, it could mean strike, it could mean that. <laughs> but it's her name Tare again, so it might mean that Tara. Oh, that Tara, you know, out there. Um, ture, swift. So it means like, come swiftly. Bodhicitta, the spirit of awakening, compassionate heart, the awakened heart. Swaha, may it be so. Uh, swaha is normally translated as so be it, but it's kind of a hard term to translate. It's funny when you look at it. Sva means self. It's the reflexive um, syllable. And then aha is the, the past 
participle version of to say. So something like self-said, <laughs> which doesn't make much sense. So they translated as hail, which is weird, but also um, so be it. It's a common ending in the Vedas to mantras that were recited to the fire. But Buddhists kind of rem remove that from that ritual context and use swaha for mantra and practice that you don't have to do with a ritual fire. This was, did that answer your question, Isabel? Uh, no. I, Not at all. Well, at least I got that out. Yeah, what did you want to ask? Uh, is, I can't remember exactly the words, so I, can I read them? Yes, yes. Can you read them? Yes, of course. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and over time, it'll come. It'll come. Then you'll wake up with it. You know it's rolling when you wake up with it. That's so fun. You wake up with a mantra in your head. You're like, okay, maybe I was even dreaming about it. But just do it again in repetition. It will it will instill itself in you over time. You might in the beginning you might think, oh my God, this will never. I'll never learn this. But that's when it's nice to listen to recordings, to sing it in the car, to just get to know it as you're going about your daily activities. Yeah, or all Bill is asking if all the twenty one thadas are different colors. So there are some gold, there's a handful of red ones, there's a couple blue ones, there's a few white ones, there's only one green one, and there's a saffron, there's sort of an orangey one, saffron orange, there's a golden orange one. So all the colors mean something, right? So, for example, the red dadas are a part of the Padma family of the lotus uh, dimension of the mandala, right? The western sunrise dimension. Fire is the element. Padma is the symbol. The green ones are the northern dimension. The element is wind. And it's so deep. It just would take way too much time. So you go with the colors. When you learn the mandala uh, teachings of what each color and quadrant of the four quadrants in the central position mean, then things start to make sense with the iconography. It's really cool. How was that, Del, for you? How was the sadhana? It was wonderful. Um, you know, the visualization kind of of rainbow light sweeping out everywhere. It reminds me of my metta practice of radiating yes. metta or just That's radiating it. compassion, radiating joy or whatever. Yes. And uh, I could kind of liken those two practices to just Good. Thing it flow over the hills and you know over the trees and touching mm -hmm. everybody yeah and um the the mantra you know you can get a little rhythm going there um yeah. you're, you know that uh it's uh you know syncopated a little bit and it kind of then it's easier and you know it's yeah. just in practice yeah, it's kind of like um lulls you or hypnotizes you. You know, we we we've evolved to love to sing together around the fire, you know, rhythmic, repetitive sounds are good for human beings to make. So this is a part of that. Yeah, and my cool. 21 Tara retreats like in Sw Switzerland, I should do one in the States soon. You know, now that things are opening up, we we, we the last evening we built a little fire. We could all sit around it. And we chanted the mantras of the first seven thadas that we had learned throughout the week to the fire. And it was so beautiful. And I have melodies for them. So mm -hmm. it can be like japa is more like om tari tu tari tere bodhicitta swaha om tari tu tari. You know, it's more monotone. And and then if you, you can do more kirtanic style devotional singing to them too. Om tari tu tari tere. Bodhicitta Svaha. Want to sing for a little bit? We'll go out singing. So that's the mantra. You see it in your thread there on the chat, a couple chats up. If you need to read it, you can read it. And I'll do the melody for a while. This is the melody that my friend Genevieve wrote. Om Tare Tutare Ture Bodhicitta Svaha. Sing with me. Even the people in the room, don't be shy. <laughs> Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Bodhicitta Svaha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Bodhicitta Svaha 
Om tare tu tare tu re Bodhicitta svaha Second part. Om tare tu tare tu re Bodhicitta svaha 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 Om tare tu tare tu re bodhicitta svaha. May it be so. So may the melody live in you. You have the recording. We'll post it now. This this whole class will be posted on the SFDC YouTube channel. So you could replay it and just be guided through the practice if you want or just through the mantra melody. So please use that and enjoy it. Make it your own and dream it. I hope that helps. I think as well, Isabel, right, that the melodies help us learn the mantras. That's the main impetus behind my project, the 21 Thadas Collective. It's uh, a couple musicians and I, Nina Rao, Genevieve Walker, and myself. We're starting a nonprofit, but we're, we're going to raise money, hopefully, eventually. We'll re- do recordings of all the melodies we've written. People can use them to support their practice with, learn the mantras, but then also we can um, use any money that comes from this project to donate to women and girls projects, probably primarily in India and Nepal, Tibet too. So that's what I'm going to focus on when my book is done, (laughs) and after I take a month of (laughs) R&R. So I'm hoping to have my book done in a couple months. The end of October is my goal. So I'm in the final stretch here. That's why I wanted to share this with you. It's not what I normally teach here, but I'm so deep in it. It's really what I'm eating, breathing, sleeping, dreaming. And so I wanted to share that part of me with you. So I hope you enjoyed. And uh, there's more ways you can learn. We can keep talking about it. Thank you. Yeah, good. So happy. Sending love. Thank you, SFDC. Don't forget to donate if you can. We really need uh, donations. Whatever you can give, five, what dollars and up, it all adds up. And we really are a collective. And we are a community, a mandala. And so let's, let's do this. This is an amazing thing. My friends from all around the world say, that SFDC is so cool. I love what they're doing. I'm like, well, come and attend and donate because we need you. <laughs> so let's do this you know i'm here eve's here we're committed so let's do it thanks everybody Big uh, love to you. one quick quick announcement i don't have the, the venmo paypal info if somebody else could post that i don't have it i was i'm sort of supposed to do that but i don't have the info tonight um it's probably on the website too if people have to go now they can pop back in on the website right and find a way to donate So, cheers, everybody. I'm going to go pick my kid up at basketball practice. (laughs) Thanks, Chandra. Bye, everybody. See you. Ciao. Thank you, Chandra. Thanks. Good to see you all. Yeah. Bye. Eve will be with you next week. You'll get Eve. I'm going to be out of of town. Thanks, Chandra. I'll see you soon. Okay. Ciao, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Oh, what book are we doing? Good. Okay, don't kill, don't kill the Zoom meeting yet. We, I meant to <laughs> remind you, get the book. 
We'll yeah. probably start it next week or the week after. So just get it and start perusing it. Look at the table of contents and read the introduction or whatever, or more. It's called Boundless Healing by Toku Tundip. So we'll, we'll dive into meditation practices of healing, which I think we all usually can need. Boundless healing. Boundless healing. Which will be good because it will use, um, I'll put it here. It will use, again, the creative faculty of the mind to imagine things, to imagine our healing, to really benefit. You know, do shamatha vipassana, but also do visualization of, of different ways we can heal ourselves, too, or at least contribute to our healing journey. So good, good things to learn. We're really enjoying the book. Um, so Eve might start it next week, or maybe I will the ne week after, but just go ahead and order it or get it from the library. Get the audio book if there is one. Do what you can just to dive in. Boundless Healing by Toku Tundup. He's a wonderful teacher. Really well respected in, in Tibet, Tibetan Buddhism. Really solid authority. You know, that's why I felt really good about recommending this book. And I've read his other books and I'm just starting to read this one more in depth. I read it, I read like part of it maybe 15 years ago. <laughs> So I'm happy to be revisiting it. Boundless Healing by Toku Tundup. Okay, everybody. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>